Okay, well, welcome everyone to this webinar on interviewing children um, in the context of children affected by armed conflict. Um, my name is Natalie McCauley and I'm from the Global Child Protection Working Group and it's great to be invited to, to do this webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar today, we will also, I will also send you a link to a Dropbox which will have some resources in it as well as this PowerPoint. Um, and also um, you will get the link to this recording at the end. So if you do have colleagues that do need to listen to it, um, they can via the recording. Um, also, it's important that if you do have a question, please don't forget to put it down in the left-hand side and I will get to it. So why do we interview children? I mean, the main reason that many of you are interviewing children is for um, the monitoring and reporting mechanism. But there's various reasons in child protection why we might be interviewing children, but it's mostly to get information in regards to their protection. So we can't really forget the response element of the MRM, which sometimes we do. Um, sometimes we just go out there, we get the information, and we don't have a clear referral pathway, we don't have a clear response mechanism in place, which can be very complicating and very challenging for the, for the situation for that child. For a young child being interviewed, it really does require great courage. And they have no idea what to expect from the process and what the possible outcomes might be. And yet they still want acceptance from us. They want to be listened to and they want to be believed. And they certainly will have some expectations that something is going to be done with the information that they give us. So we need to really be clear with them what their expectations are and what we can actually deliver. We should never make any promises we can't keep. But basically, at each stage in the decision-making process, it tr triggers a new search for information. So in, a, in case management in child protection, um, this process of information management is really only the starting point of a, of a process of analysing, taking actions and reviewing those plans to ensure the best interest of the child. This can be forgotten in MRM, so we need to keep reminding ourselves that, that these children do have a process and a journey to go to, and certainly that we need to be making sure that we have some idea of what sort of response we can give them at the end. So I just want you to think for a minute about some of the barriers that might come up during, during an interview, and if you could type some of those answers in the left-hand side, that would be great. What are some of the barriers to getting information during an interview? Anyone got any? Cultural sensitivity, absolutely, yes. Even cultural misunderstandings, consent. Language. Language would be a big one, I imagine, particularly in this context. Yes, consent. Understanding feelings and getting the feelings, yes. Right place for the interview, absolutely. They're all really, really good examples. There are many, many barriers actually. Children being reluctant to talk, absolutely, climbing up. And I think um, we have to put ourselves in their shoes. I mean, they're not always going to trust the interview. They may be sh afraid of sharing the information. And there may be some um, capacity of the interviewer themselves. That was a good one that's just come up just now. Thanks for that. So some of them would be the age of the child and of the interviewer. So some of that can be cultural context that can come into that as well. Interest in the topic, like do they really want to be talking about it? They might be bored. They might know the offender, like they may know the perpetrators of, of these incidents or those that are subject to the questioning. They may be related to those, the, the perpetrators. Um, they may have been groomed before the interview, so they may have had information given to them to either not talk or to indicate another piece of information. They don't want to get the perpetrators into trouble. Usually that's if they have some sort of relationship with them. They don't want to split the family up. So sometimes when these interviews occur, it can end up meaning in further separation of families. 
They don't want to get into trouble themselves. Um, they just want to forget about what's occurred. They don't want to talk to any sort of formal mechanism, so there's a distrust sometimes. They're unfamiliar with the surroundings that, that they may be in, so let's say they are but they have fled to a refugee camp or they are not at, in their usual home setting, so that might be unfamiliar. Or they're taken somewhere to go to these interviews. Um, so it could be someone's office or a school that they're not used to, for example. Talking to a complete stranger about something they don't want to talk about. So again, we have to put ourselves in their shoes. Think of the worst day of your life. Would you want to be talking to a complete stranger about that? Probably not would be the answer. Um, they understand that it is a crime that warrants reporting. So they understand sometimes the severity of what has occurred, um, that it violates people's rights and the like. They can, may even understand the consequences depending on their age. Um, and that can actually be a barrier for them to report depending on how they use the information. They have a relationship with the perpetrators. Time of the day, surprisingly, um, we don't think about this enough, but sometimes we might interview way, way too early for that child or too late. It might be the time, the schedule that they're usually having dinner or bathing before they go to bed, or it might be the time for their afternoon nap. Um, we need to think about the time we schedule. It may also be the time of the day that they do something that's fun. So it might be the time of the day that they go to a child-friendly space or they are participating in something in their community and we pull them out of that and that can be a barrier. The memory of the event itself can be a barrier. Their ability to communicate, particularly depending on their age, but also about maybe their ability. They may have a disability of some sort. The parent and caregiver isn't willing to support them. Child not wanting to talk. Child not, not just not wanting to talk at all certainly not wanting to talk to authorities. Parents not believing their story. So some of the specific incidents, particularly when it comes to um, sexual abuse, the parents might not believe um, or want to believe. And the child doesn't want to tell the story again and again. So sometimes the MRM teams are not the first people that have come to talk to the child about that incident. And we know that multiple interviews is, is not the best approach. So what we're going to talk about today is a forensic interview framework, which we know, based on research, um, does work the best for children. The framework it really looks at ensuring the child does most of the talking and we do most of the listening. So when I first was learning about this, basically, um, one of my mentors on forensic interviewing told me that I do my best work when I keep my mouth shut in these interviews. So really, if you're hearing yourself speak too much in an interview, then something's going wrong. So you need to be able to just let the child speak. And obviously, that means we're gathering more information from the child, and we're not persuading them in any direction with the information that they're giving us. We also know that research shown that without practice of this framework, because it's not the way we usually speak or we would usually conduct a conversation, or that we would usually find out information from friends or family, that really within the first three months of learning this type of framework, our skill set will fall down um, and deplete if we don't practice. I guess you have to think of it like a Olympic um, runner or a, a World Cup footballer, they train every day. They don't just they don't just train when they do their matches. So you actually have to train with this framework outside of the interviewing setting. So not just when you're doing an interview with a child, but you need to be training using this framework with your friends, your family, um, and those that are around you. And it actually can be quite fun. I've used I use this on my <laughs> niece and nephew all the time. Now they know that I'm using it, they make fun of me, but it actually can be really worthwhile to try it around them. So basically the framework is this. You have an introduction and you establish rapport. You have your ground rules, introducing your topic of concern, the free narrative component, which is probably the most um, 
alien to us. It's a, definitely a different way um, for us to hold a conversation, and it's different for the kids as well when they when they're first doing it. The specific questions and the closure. These um, this is not an unusual framework. So if you were to look at if you were to Google interview frameworks, it would pretty much have this six. Um, although many may not focus on the free narrative unless um, we're talking about interviewing children. But this um, framework can work very well with adults as well because it's based on the research of how our brains are made up and how we um, regurgitate information basically. So we see information in pictures first and then we have to attach a language to those pictures. So free narrative is about getting as much language around the full picture as possible. So let's go with the first part, which is introduction and establishing rapport. Um, it's surprising how many times I've seen workers doing an interview and they don't actually introduce who, who they are. And this is the key, really, in the process of even getting clear consent because before you do the interview obviously you would be seeking informed consent but even at the introduction um, and establishing rapport phase you need to be really really clear with the child at all times what you can give them what you can't give them um, and what the process is going to be certainly you should be making sure that you have at least 45 minutes available to yourself for the interview, you should not be rushing this process. Free narrative can sometimes take even longer than that. Um, and you should be prepared to also get your information elsewhere. So your child, the child is not the best person to get the information from. Um, it just should be one form of verification. So they, the introductions need to be conducted in a relaxed and child-centered manner. And what does that mean? Well. I mean, when you think about it, sometimes the locations where you're doing interviews are not necessarily a place where a child might feel safe, might feel relaxed. Um, I've seen these sorts of interviews done in front of, um, in front of military, for example. I've seen them done um, on the outskirts of child-friendly space to keep them away from um, the main crowd but then the local police could see exactly what they were doing. So um, you really have to make sure that you pick the right environment. I've also seen inside the house because people thought that they might feel a bit safer inside the house, but then the whole family was listening in. So you don't want everyone around. We know that in communities um, there are people that are inquisitive and will want to come around, but you need to be prepared um, for that and manage that because you need crowd control. You do not want everyone knowing that you're there, nor do you want everyone knowing what you're talking about with the child. Um, the children definitely need to be introduced to everyone who's there. So you need to keep it to a minimum if you can. So. Ideally, it would just be the interviewer and one other person which would either be a note taker or would be a translator. And one of, the, one of the two of you would have to do the notes either way. Does this make sense so far? Okay, great. And so we also need to to make sure that the child knows where the toilets are. Because um, surprisingly, kids do need to go to the toilet um, and they may generally, well, in my experience with my toddler, she always needs to go to the toilet when I least want her to. So, um, so make sure you know where the toilet is and make sure you know that that's a safe location for the child as well. Um, and making sure that uh, there is sort of space for any sort of toys or materials if they just want to play, particularly the younger ones, the toddlers. Um, any, any child that is verbal, any child that can communicate verbally can actually be interviewed. It's just that you would need to use more free narrative the younger they are. Certainly, um, if a parent 
wants to be present, um, you can't stop them from being present. But they, but ideally, you would want the child to pick an adult to be present. If, if a parent wants to be present, maybe one way to get around that particular parent being there would be to ask the child who they would pick to be there, um, and and then have another adult there that the parent is comfortable with. Um, it's difficult because sometimes the parents can influence the conversation. But again, hopefully you've interviewed the parents as well. Um, ensure that the child has developmentally appropriate understanding of the role and responsibilities of you guys. Um, it's really difficult for kids at a very young age to really understand what your role is and what information you're going to give. They're used to maybe social workers from a ministry or police they're probably not used to um, monitoring and reporting people that are taking information and maybe just facilitating resources afterwards. So you need to be really clear what you're doing with the information to them. The younger they are, obviously, the least, uh, less able they are to understand that. But you can talk about your job being about protecting, protecting children and that um, this information is really important so that you can protect all children. You can talk about that, um, but obviously not making any promises you can't keep. Um, make sure you explain why one of you will take notes and how they're going to use the notes, um, and also that there's really not going to be much confidentiality. Um, yeah. You, you do have some level of confidentiality, but the information is going to be used and other people are going to see it. Um, and certainly if you need to um, facilitate resources for that child, people will um, have that information. So um, it's important to, to make sure that they realise that if um, some of the information needs to be shared with specialist practitioners to, to assist them, it will be. if, if you're in a situation that that is possible. Um, so, yes, the information does remain confidential, but you will end up using some of it sometimes. So you need to be really careful how you explain confidentiality. Otherwise, you can't do a proper response. Um, establish... Uh, if the child knew you were coming, I mean, that's really important. Um, make sure the child doesn't feel isolated or trapped. Um, even the where you actually locate um, the interview, where you place the interview can, can assist in that. Um, and make sure that they know that they can get up and go to the toilet and we can stop the interview at any time. Uh, Make sure, again, if, the, if there is a parent present, that you do watch the mannerisms between the two. And, and if your gut says that, if your um, intuition says that it's, it's not appropriate, that the interview is not going the way it's meant to, that the child is acting out because the parent is there or they're clamming up because the parent is there, then just, just either um, stop the interview or um, have a conversation separately with, with the parent on how to manage that. Sorry, I'm just reading some of the questions down the side. Yes, you can, you can highlight the parts of the information which would be shared with others and take the child's consent on that, absolutely. So you, you can be really clear that you're not going to share all the information. Of course, you're not going to share all the information, but you will share, have, may have to share some of the information to, to give them assistance, absolutely. And you can be really clear on that. So making sure that you establish boundaries for the interview. Um, it's important, um, particularly for adolescent and high-risk adolescents, kids that you already know are acting out. Um, oh, okay. So one of one of the participants has asked if you can all make sure that your questions are asked publicly so everyone can see them. If that's okay. <laughs> 
Um, so make sure that the child understands um, what you expect um, and to what extent possible. That is that if the child is one that is already acting out that that um, they're not permitted to hurt themselves in the interview or, or, or you for that matter. Um, so you can establish that boundary at any point in the interview and um, my suggestion would be if there is a child in that state that you would stop the interview straight away. Um, and also making sure that uh, you're clear that, it, that these children aren't always necessarily going to be happy or sad, um, they're not necessarily going to maintain that throughout, um, but, you've, but you've got to make sure that those children feel safe um, and that they actually are safe. So these are two different things. The child might feel safe, but as the adult in the situation, you need to be making sure that the child is safe. Um, and making sure that you're a good listener. So as I said, not talking so much. Um, and taking very seriously what the child has to say. Is this making sense to everyone? Great. So really, the, the, beginning, the beginning part is really about make, letting the child speak freely. So um, not talking too much, gaining that sort of level of rapport, making sure that you engage on something that is positive for the child preferably, and that maybe you use some free narrative skills even in that stage, which we'll talk about a bit later, to actually keep that um, type of conversation going so the child starts to get used to your weird way of asking questions. Um, and also making sure that um, you're enjoying the, the time with the child and that the child generally, genuinely feels that. Um, you have to like children to do this. So if you have an interviewer or a translator out there that is not um, great with kids, then, then maybe this, this role um, you may need to work with them on how to get that sort of um, genuine rapport with children because kids will pick up on that very quickly. So number two is establishing the ground rules. So encourage the child to say if they don't understand a question. So you'll see on our handout that I sent you, there's a few suggestions um, on that. If you don't know the answer to my question, that's okay. If you need to go to the toilet or need a drink, just tell me and we can do that. Use whatever words you want to. If you don't understand a question, tell me and I'll try to ask it another way. Another way of doing that is also to ask the child how would they indicate to you that they don't know a question or they don't understand what you're talking about. So sometimes children might say, I'll put up my hand um, or I'll clap. Um, or I'll just tell you. Some of them will just say, I'll just tell you. But checking in with them is really important. Um, encourage them to indicate if they fail to understand a question. And again, establish whether the child or young person knew you were coming and what they were told by whom. Does that make sense? The ground rules are pretty normal. Do you all do ground rules? That, is that the one of the easier parts of the of the process? But this also requires you to know where the toilet is, to have water available. Um, and also just making sure that you will give them an opportunity to ask it another way. Okay, Amal has a question on the, the child knowing we are coming or not. Do they have to know we are coming? No, they don't have to know, but you need to know whether they knew or not you were coming is, is the point. Yeah. 
So it's not it's not necessary that they know that you are coming, but you just need to understand what is their understanding of you turning up. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Great. So, you know, once you've done your rapport, once you have your ground rules, it's time to start. Um, and we need to know where the child knows the purpose of the interview, which is this whole understanding of why you're there. Um, so do you know what we've come here to talk about today? Or tell me what we've come here to talk about today. These are the two questions you can ask. The better one is the tell me. Why do you think that is? Because the first one is a closed question. The first one you'll often get a yes or no answer to. Um, tell me what we've come here to talk about today. Um, will we'll usually garner some sort of answer. And it may not be the answer you're expecting. So you may actually get more information about another incident. So we are not putting a box on the information we're getting from these kids. Um, we may end up getting a different report than we thought. We may be going for two reports from the one location. Um, so for example, um, if they may say that they don't know why you've come, and that's actually okay. Um, but this gives them an opportunity to either tell you that they know, or to give you maybe more information about something that you weren't even knowing existed or you didn't have your radar on. So this is some really simple language here. Um, but it could be like the interviewer, um, if they say no, that they don't know why you've come, you would say something like, I heard that um, there was a bombing last week. Was there a bombing last week? And then that starts the conversation. I heard that your uncle was killed last week. Was your uncle killed last week? Um, I heard that um, there was a, a problem in your community on Saturday. Was there a problem in your community on Saturday? And then this gives you this opportunity to start free narrative. So does that make sense? So you ask a clarifying question that's pointed at whatever the incident is. So I heard that. Um, and you try to keep the incident away from any perpetrator language. So you would never use um, an armed group's name or an individual's name um, that might be a perpetrator of some sort. So you would just try to frame it around an incident. I heard that this incident occurred. Did this incident occur? So does that make sense? If the child says no, then really you're at the end of your interview. Yeah, Sarah. Question please, Sarah, what does that mean? I heard, yeah. Yes. You could say, I understand that this occurred. Yeah, but you have heard something, haven't you? If you're interviewing that child, you have heard something. Okay. So do you interview children without any information at all? We'll get to that, Shah. So why would you interview a child if you didn't have any information? Okay, right. So if, if okay, um, an example's been given if you were interviewing children in a hospital who had been interviewed, who, who have been injured, sorry, you would uh, ask them about their injury. 
So you would say, oh, I can see that you've you've got a, a, a injured arm. Tell me about your injured arm. Does that make sense? So in a camp, for example, recent arrivals, you would just be asking them um, about their journey. So you've just arrived here. You had a trip all the way here over the last week. Tell me, um, I heard you had a trip here. Did you have a trip here? Yeah, but the witness stuff comes with the free narrative. So at this stage, you want a parameter around your conversation because the way people think is in photographs, which I'll explain in a minute. You do not want to be putting parameters on on things yet. If they've witnessed stuff on their journey or before their journey, you can put the parameters on here. So if your assumption is that they witnessed it before the journey, then you would say, um, I heard you had to leave your home. Because you did, that's why they're there. Did you have to leave your home? Yes. Tell me everything about why you had to leave your home, which we'll go into in a minute with the free narrative. But it's really critical for you to frame what you need here. Yeah, exactly, Ida. I heard you were heard in Syria. Were you heard in Syria? Exactly. So it's really about framing the conversation without actually pinpointing any perpetrators at this point, they will come up with that in the free narrative. But even the, I heard you were heard in Syria, is quite large. I mean, it's a good way of starting it, um, certainly if they're injured and you can see them injured. Um, but it's actually quite, quite a large gamut. Usually you would have more information than that, would you not? Or maybe not. Before you're talking to them, would you know where they're from? Okay, because I think we have to remember that the children shouldn't be our first point of call for information. Um, they should only be part of the puzzle. So as much as possible, particularly with children, particularly the younger ones, the older ones we can probably manage it more, but the younger ones, you need to get more point of reference. You could say, I, I heard you were heard in your neighbourhood, were you heard in your neighbourhood, because you can usually find out where they're from, right? No? Yes? No? <laughs> Have I lost you all? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I, I guess that's the point. Like, the rapport building is really important, the identifying the people around them, um, but it is about us listening. Um, yeah, yes, exactly. Um, and the going in cold is can be can be really difficult, but that's why I think you need to leave it open and not um, make assumptions about where the information is going to come from or what they're actually going to tell us. Because in my experience, by keeping it a little bit open, but by framing it, um, we've gotten many many reports about different incidents along the way. Because quite often these kids haven't just witnessed one thing; they've witnessed many. So um, we need to be making sure that we keep that that option open to them. But let's let's we can come back to the the follow up question. But but I think you all understand the sort of idea around it. If if our um, if our brain is keeping things in photographs, we want to basically frame the photograph. This starting point frames the photograph, so that then we can unpack the full picture. So let's talk about free narrative for a minute. Absolutely, that just on a point that's on the left-hand side here, the interviewer's face and expressions and gestures are really important, and that includes minimal in encouragers, which we'll also talk about. Absolutely. If you don't seem interested, um, and even if you you seem like you're rushing, the child will feel like you're rushing, and they'll they'll give up information on anything, but it might not necessarily be valid or verified information. 
Um, so we have to really be understanding, empathise and really um, show patience in the process, which can be really difficult. Um, but this is sort of the process of, of free narrative. Um, the, the round circles are signposts. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're key bits of information that you want to go back to. And in free narrative, it's not necessarily important to remember every little detail that the child says, but it is around the signposts because what will happen is, is you're getting layers of information that are about the same thing. And what it is doing, it's creating this picture that I've been talking to you about. So really, the, the main part of the question to remember for you is tell me everything. Tell me everything. Just keep that in your mind. Tell me everything. You only have to ask that question a number of times and then that is really all you're asking. And you'll be surprised how much information you get. The signposts are really key though. You have to document them because you have to come back to them. Of course there should be a, a note taker taking as much information as possible. But if you're getting, if you're not getting everything down, then make sure you get the the signpost down and you get it down the way the child has articulated it. Don't correct the language. This is a really important point for your translator that they should not correct the language, that they need to be using the language the child uses. Yeah, I. Look, um, recorders are something that is still in discussion. You, you could from a note-taking perspective, but I'm not sure what standard operating procedures you've, you've designed in MENA. There are some areas that they... So Ida, you need, to, you need to say whether they're able to use recorders or not. Because there are some locations that they're not allowing that. Okay, so they have been advised that at least for Syria MRM, they're not allowed to use recorders. That's not unusual, so don't feel like that's an unusual thing. The most places, um, they, 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 they don't let recorders being used. Actually, even in Australia, we're not allowed to use recorders when interviewing children. So it's, um, it's not unusual. That's why free narrative is great, because you're not usually asking any questions. You're just letting the child speak and if you need to write a bit more down, that gap can actually help the child. It's like a minimal encourager to help the child keep talking. So it actually can be quite positive. Um, so, um, yes, <laughs> another, another reiteration of send to everyone. Um, so everyone can see the questions. Okay, so what you need to remember is that tell me everything and then you have the signposts which are these blue dots. Now let's go to this. Okay, so this is how our brain remembers things. Our brain remembers things in pictures and it takes us a little bit of time to put language around those pictures. And as we put language around those pictures, we put language around the highlighted parts of those pictures. So let's say you've got your first layer at the top. So I'll take an easy example. Tell me everything um, about last Saturday from the beginning to the very end and try not to leave anything out. Well, on Saturday I woke up and I went to um, the shops and I bought some food and then we had some breakfast and then I came home and I cleaned the house and then in the afternoon we played some games and then I made some dinner and um, the whole family made the dinner and we all ate it together and then I went to bed. So um, you can do that and that's what a first layer sometimes looks like but you can have some specific signposts that you got out of that. And as you can see, if you looked at this slide, you're only get, going to get components of the picture of my day. And you're certainly not going to get um, 
you know, maybe some of the important points if someone had come around or if someone had um, come in to have a conversation with our family, you're not going to necessarily get that on the first layer because I may not see the importance of it. And my brain hasn't necessarily put that into language yet. So you use the signposts and the signposts, you would say, for example, on that first, on the second signpost, where you're taking it down further, you would say, tell me everything from the part where and you, till the end of the day when you went to bed. You need to keep exhausting the memory. So you need to keep going to the end of that actual um, photograph. You, you don't just take it to where you want it to go. Um, yes. Um, I understand the, the presence of the note taker can be a problem, but but recording um, recording can also be a problem because they not necess Why would note taking be a problem for a child? Let me let you answer that question. That's there. Why is note taking a, a problem for a child? Why are they avoiding to respond? Is one. My thinking is, is they're avoiding to respond because they're intim intimidated by someone writing notes. Um, recording's actually the same, except they may not have a conceptual understanding of what the recording is. So it's sort of like um, we're not <laughs> we're manipulating and we're not actually giving the child. Um, a, a full picture and we really need to have them having a full understanding of what that recording can do. It's a really risky recording in so many ways and in fact it actually help, it, it actually can hinder an interviewer because you're not taking as much attention as you would be if you're taking notes um, and you're not getting <coughs> that full picture during that. Um, so let's keep moving forward. If you can keep seeing the layers of free narrative, um, the picture just starts getting clearer and clearer. Now, if you if you went to the beginning of that, you can't get a full picture of that person's day or the incident that you're talking about. The first layer is never the full picture. And in fact, you get some of the most detailed information when you keep going layer and layer down because you might get numbers, you might get the people involved, um, you may get a full, far more perspective and you may even get locations because um, because it's the way our brain works, you'll get more descriptive the further you go down. <coughs> also, um, also the other the other thing about this is is that it's very difficult to um, make a mistake um, or, or to lie if you're doing free narrative because you can't keep telling this same story the whole way along. So we're back on my Saturday and we've only got five signposts where well, you would start again. So so tell me about the part where you woke up and tell me everything from, from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed because I would start there because it didn't give much information. Another suggestion would be if you knew that nothing happened from the time they woke up to the time they went to the shop, you could start from the time they went to the shop which would be the second signpost. Um, but in the initial stages, it's always better to go the full length and then to shorten it and shorten it. So tell me everything from the part where you went to the shop, from the time the time you got ready to go to the shop till all the way till the time you went to bed without leaving anything out, even if you think it's not important. And you let the child speak. So each layer, you'll get a lot more detail. So I went to the shop and I actually went to the corner shop this time. Um, I don't usually go to the corner shop because 
I usually have a lot more time and I really wanted to make sure that we that we got to go to the park at some point during the day. And you can see, like, even if you were to have this interview, even if you were to test it out on friends or family, you can't help but give more detail the further layer you go down. <laughs> and children get it. They, they're like, oh, so I didn't give enough information on that first layer, all right, so I'll keep going. But you'll also get some verification of the information that they've already given you. So if there are inconsistencies in their story, it will come up here. Is this making sense? Is it making sense? Yes, great. So you keep going through the day and you don't have to actually go back to the shop if you've got enough information there. So you said you, you came home from the shops. Tell me everything from the time you came home from the shops to the time you went to bed. Try not to leave anything out, even if you think it's not important. And off you go again. But remember, you have to keep letting them exhaust the memory. Even if you've got the incident in amongst that, you have to let them go all the way to bed. You can, Shah, but, but the key would be to cut it down. So if you knew, so let's say you weren't sure when it happened on the Saturday, but after the first layer, you realised it happened sometime after lunch, um, you could still go from the time they went to the shop to the time they went to bed. Then if the second layer confirmed it happened after lunch, then you could say, so you all had lunch together. Tell me everything from the time you had lunch together till the time you went to bed. And then if you could confirm the, the clarifying information on either side of the incident, then you can focus in on the incident after that. So I would at least do two to three layers before I would focus in. But you still need to then have the clear part of the photograph that you're going to focus in on. So you still need the, the end part. So you still need to say to them, for example, if you knew it happened in the mid-afternoon um, at the park, you would say, tell me everything from the time you went to the park to the time you came home. Try not to leave anything out, even if you think it's not important. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right, Reem. And, and you know, in my experience, it has opened my eyes to incidences that I didn't even know occurred and even dynamics... Um, even dynamics in the community that you probably didn't understand. So it's actually very helpful for our role. <coughs> no, actually, um, actually, this uh, Amal, this was originally designed for torture and sexual violence, um, and and free narrative is the safest way to get the information be, that that you need for from them. They will um, tell us. Um, you use their language. So, for example, um, if, it's, if it's sexual violence, you still use the same thing. You still use a photograph. So let's say it happened at the park. You've done the whole day. You've done part of the day. And you come back to the park. So tell me everything from the time you arrived to the park to the time you came home. Um, and then if there are specifics in that, um, you would uh, you would also then ask them specific questions at the end if you needed to, but you usually don't need to because they give you the information. But also you need to use their language. So again, I want to reiterate that this is this is evidence-based interviewing. This is the best practice interviewing, and this is based on research of how the brain actually works and how we regurgitate information and reliable um, information that is verified. And again, it's also information where 
It's it's so reliable that it would hold up anywhere in the world. So it's also information that is less likely to cause harm for, for, for the child because it's coming from the child in a way that is safe for them because their brain is articulating it in a safe fashion. If you ask specific questions, it can get very, very dangerous. So when I'm talking about child's language, I'm talking about... Uh, I'm talking about maybe language around genitalia. Um, they may not use um, vagina, they may not use penis, they may not use all of that sort of language. Um, they may also, when it comes to torture and violence, they may use different language around that because it could be around punishment, it could be around um, whatever words have been attached to it by the adult. Um, so whatever words they use, you need to use it. You can ask clarifying questions at the end, but only at the very end after you've exhausted free narratives if you don't understand um, if you don't understand what they're talking about. Specific questions can be dangerous because it's limiting in the way it's it's lim first of all it's limiting in the way you're going to get the information but it also can be biased by the way you construct a specific question. Um, in the past, uh, specific questions have, have certainly caused a lot of problems when it comes to child protection because we're putting our adult um, mindset um, and what we're hearing from other adults onto the child when we're asking those specific questions. We're putting adult language into might, what might be a ch very child, um, child-centered memory, if that makes sense. Also, we're missing out on a lot of information. It's very easy to manipulate yes and no answers as well. So, if there is some, um, if there is some grooming on either not talking or on on saying certain people have done certain things. Um, Specific questions certainly feed into that. The other reason why it's dangerous is it can cause harm because it's not the child's brain coming up with what the story is. We're not letting the story come out in a safe fashion. If you do free narrative, it allows a layered approach. It allows the picture to be... It allows the brain time to attach um, language to the picture that is inside the memory that's inside the brain. Um, and it gives it gives the child a chance to to show us whether they can go forward with the conversation or not. Whereas a specific question takes them right into it straight away. Not really um, informed consent in that way. There's a lot of problems with specific questions. I would avoid them as much as possible, except to clarify right right at the end. I know, as I say, only if you need to. If you do free narrative well. You often don't need to do specific questions. And remember, we're, you know, we have to remember the do no harm principle and we have to remember that children are not our only way of getting information. Um, so sometimes even the, best, um, even the best interviewers don't get all children to speak and that's actually okay. So let me just talk about open-ended questions for a second. So these are questions that encourage an elaborate response. So this is what free narrative is about. They don't specify what specific information is required um, and they allow the child to choose what information they will tell you. Um, yeah, I mean, Ida, you're right. We, can't, we have to remember we cannot be in a rush when we are interviewing. We should only do interviews with children when we have the time to do it well and right in a way that is safe for the, and okay for that child. Absolutely. I think um, our need for information sometimes overrides the, the rights of that child and we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. It's really critical that we get this information but it's also equally as critical that we look after that child. Um, allow the child to choose what information they will tell you. Free narrative does that. Um, and it'll give you a lot more indicators of whether there's a level of distress in that child, 
whether you should keep moving forward or whether also can you get this information from somewhere else because the child when they do their first couple of layers of free narrative may give you other witnesses. Um, initial open-ended question. Tell me everything about what happened from the beginning to the very end. Try not to leave anything out, even if you think it's not important. So this is in the middle of your of your handout, but I would be you know I would be pinning this every <laughs> everywhere. If your job is to interview kids, this is what you need to remember. But also this is really great for adults. Adults regurgitate information the same way, um, and if you really want to get the full picture, that's unjaded or as unjaded as possible, free narrative is the best way to get reliable information. You can, you can, it's very difficult. Only the best liars in the world can do four or five layers of free narrative consistently um, and have the same consistent story. So, you know, this is, could be a strategy that just ends up being the way that you have your conversations and your, and your interviews. So having this question particularly, tell me everything about what happened from the beginning to the very end. Try not to leave anything out, even if you think it's not important. Becomes should become your mantra. You could have that up on your on your um, computer every day so you remember it and you practice it with everyone. So as I said, you've got your first layer. You tell me everything. It's not boring for children when they're talking for 15 minutes. So that tell me everything means that, that you're interested in what they have to say. You're not asking these questions over and over. And what you're doing is, is you're regurgitating what they said. So, you know, your second layer, tell me everything about the part where you're using their, their language. So they they really feel like you're actually um, that you're actually listening. So um, yes, you can say tell me more, but in a you, you need to use minimal encouragers. You need to use things like uh huh, mm hmm, and then what happened. So this is our first layer. Tell me everything about what happened from the beginning to the end. Try not to leave anything out, even if you think it's not important. So there you here we've got an example. Tell me what you, we've come here to talk about today, about what happened at the park. Tell me everything about what happened at the park from the beginning to the very end. Try not to leave anything out, even if you think it's not important. Uncle Greg always hurts me. Tell me everything about when Uncle Greg hurts you from the beginning to the very end. Try not to leave anything out, even if you think it's not important. This is what you're talking about, Shah. Talking about these minimal encouragers. Keeping the free narrative going does not always need an open-ended question. So minimal encouragers is the most effective way. Now this is also our facial expressions, our physical expression as well. What we're trying to do is not break the child's, na child's narrative. We want them to talk. If, if you are asking lots of questions, you're not doing it right. You need to have your, you need to be able to sit on your hands <laughs> and not ask anything, let the child speak. Do not interrupt the child's train of thought or recollection, don't try to help them, don't try to correct their language. Indicate to the child that they are being listened to and understood. You've got your aha, you've got your mmm, you've got your silence. Silence is amazing. How many adults can sit in silence for 30 seconds? <laughs> you wanna fill the space and they will fill the space. And then repeating the last few words of the child's last sentence is always a good is always a good minimal encourager. Oh, and sorry, he approached you at the park. He approached you at the park. And so you're repeating what the child said so that you can keep on moving forward. Open ended breath questions. So when we're recalling an event Children will initially recall a series of broad activities or actions, only part of the picture. As I said, that's what I said with the, particularly the first layer. You have those signposts. Another way of keeping the um, conversation going if the minimal encouragers don't work, you would ask, what happened then? What else happened when? So what else happened when the man approached you in the park? Or what happened then? 
Um, yeah, I completely understand why you would be emotionally affected um, in in some of the interviews. Um, I don't know if it's good or bad, actually. I mean, I think if you can maintain if you can maintain a level of empathy, um, and if you can hold yourself together so that afterwards is when when the child is not around, um, because what you want the child to really understand is their feelings and their stories. Um, it's while it's devastating what they're sometimes telling us. Um, their reactions are normal and what is going on is a process. Um, and um, it's important that, that we get the story from them. So um, depends how um, emotionally affected you are. If you can maintain it so that it's showing empathy, I think that can work in your favour because the child can really understand that you care. But you don't want to be too too um, one way or the other because these some some children will want to tell you more, and it won't always necessarily be the truth if you're too much one way or the other. If that makes sense. Um, but but going back to the minimal encouragers, if the minimal encouragers are not working so well, you would say what happened then or what else happened when. Um, this can also keep the free narrative going if you feel the the memory has not been exhausted. Remember, we're trying to get them into that box, that photograph. So Greg gave me a truck to play with. What happened then? Alan was playing with Greg at our house, and then Alan left. What happened after Alan left? So you're keeping the free narrative going to the boundary that you have given them. We went to the park and played football. What else happened when you went to the park? Does that make sense? So once you get down to your second layer, you've got your second layer of, of signposts. Tell me everything about the part where. So you're not going back to the beginning of the sign, you're not going back to the beginning of the story. You've picked your first signpost. It may be the second or third signpost. Um, it's up to you. You have to make that call on the day. But basically you, you want to bring them back to that part and you want to again close it off at the end of that photograph. So you want to take them all the way to the end of the story, so exhaust the memory. And keep using the minimal encouragers, the aha, uh -huh, the mm, mm and then also you can use what happened when, tell me more about the part where, tell me everything about the part where. So then we've got our open-ended depth questions. The child, then we played the rough game. Tell me everything about when you played the rough game. So this is when you're focusing in. Um, I can't remember who asked me the question about focusing in, but this would, this would be when you start focusing in. And then I had dinner. What happened when you had dinner? We went to the park and played football. Tell me more about the park when you were playing football. So you, you keep focusing in until you've got the the core package, the core part of the photograph that you actually want. And all the stuff around it can actually really help you um, give really great services or at least refer them to great services. And as I said, it may also give you more cases that you need to investigate. So does that make sense for free narrative before I go into the tips for free narrative? Make sure that's clear. Great. Okay, so just some quick tips. Well, can we express our agreement or disagreement with the child if required by the child? No. No would be my quick answer to that. Um, you're not there to agree or disagree to the child, with the child. You, they're there to tell you a story. Um, you, you'd be surprised, Ida, um, regarding perpetrator information. 
you'll get a lot of information for free narrative um, that will give you a clear picture of who the perpetrator is. Um, and you can ask specific questions after this if you need to, or if you don't think the child's going to be able to give you that specific information, the free narrative will give you enough information to be able to ask other people um, that specific information if you need it. Does that make sense? Because the, the free narrative gives you such a full picture um, that uh, the free narrative gives you such a full picture that you get so much information um, that it, the first time you guys do this, it'll be really, um, <laughs> it may even be quite overwhelming how much information you get. But you must be patient you really have to learn to be tolerant with silences. I found that very difficult when I first started doing this. You have to get really comfortable with space. Don't fill the space. Let the child be the one that fills the space or the, whoever you're interviewing. Don't interrupt. It's really a big thing with adults when we want to get information. We're a bit like those journalists um, that you see on the TV that just shove microphones in people's faces and ask five questions. Um, and expect to get the full picture. This is a completely different approach to the way we usually handle situations. So be kind to yourself about it. But my, the key would be not to ask any questions as you're learning this. So if you're sitting there and you're not sure where to go to next, then don't ask anything. Just let the child keep talking until you work out where you want to go next. Um, look, it also... The research would say that if a child is not responding to, to any of the requests for the, for the full picture, there's two options for you. One is to realise that maybe this is not the best day for that child and to work out another time. You need to assess whether you're in the right location for them to have this sort of conversation. Um, can you get your information from anywhere else? Um, and if not, um, if you really think that that this interview is absolutely essential, there's no other way, and it has to be now, then go back to the rapport phase. Go back to talking to the child about what they want to talk about and make that a longer conversation. You could even do that for 15 to 20 minutes, but take your time. Um, you, it's really important you avoid specific questions while the children are engaged in free narrative because what that does is it interrupts the photograph. Um, and, it, and what it could lead it to is big gaps in the photograph. You might not know their gaps because you might not see them, but you will miss out on a lot of information. Um, the non-verbal cues are really important for encouragement. So while we're not agreeing or disagreeing with the child, we are encouraging them with our non-verbals. Um, our mm, our ah, ah's, our little nodding, not big, big nodding, just gentle nodding. Um, but also tell me about the part where and and then what happened and what else happened when is clarifying to the child that you're actually actively listening to them. Don't overly praise or encourage the child through the interview. This can actually be very problematic, particularly with kids that have gone through multiple incidences of um, profound stress, maybe living in profound stress, maybe living in a state of toxic stress, um, it can lead to misinformation and unreliable information. If you can avoid asking questions with a yes or no, if you do do that, um, just go back to the free narrative. Um, you know, don't punish yourself, just get them back into the free narrative process. So. Um, the example they give here is, did you go home after that? That would be a yes or no. Um, tell me everything about the part from where you went home, you know, and then make sure, make sure you go back to your end photograph, end part of your photograph. And as it says here, what else happened? Tell me more about that. Active listening is key. As I said, just be really patient. Just listen. Just don't talk. Um, 
it, it's a really, uh, the examples they use here are about body parts, are quite interesting. Um, Private, Winky, Rudy, Fanny or Willy. I don't know how that would translate into Arabic. So you need to talk to the translators about this. Um, it can be very uncomfortable for some translators if they haven't been in this sort of work before. It can be culturally sensitive, um, but we have to have the conversation about how they're going to put language around some of these sensitive terms or and, and understanding that it's okay if children use that sort of language. We don't want translators correcting the children either because that can also um, make children clam up. And, um, and we don't want children um, pointing to, to forced point to body parts. Um, but younger kids, when you're asking specific questions, you can do that. We've got to remember this is a difficult and painful process. I mean, if we... If we feel emotional when we're listening, um, imagine how these ki kids are feeling. Um, and I think we have to be okay with the interviewing ending when someone is very, very upset. Um, the advantage of free narrative is, is you'll usually get an indicator of some sort that, um, that the information is going to be very, very upsetting. Um, and uh, and at that stage, you can limit how many layers you go down to um, and use the information you do get or come back another time. Um, but I would never force a child to keep talking um, when they're distressed. Um, you still need to go through the final parts, like you still need to do your closure. Um, you wouldn't just stop the interview, you still need to go through the ticks on the closure component, so explain what you'll do, explain what will happen next, um, provide them an opportunity to ask questions, and making sure that they're going to be looked after and adequately supported after you leave. Um, let me just read some of these questions. I agree, Reem. I think we should make sure they've had some training. Um, Ida says, yes, translators should not be used unless you have taken the time to explain to them the MRM purpose, confidentiality, the interview process and what is expected of them. Um, so we need to definitely try and get this information across to them and maybe we need to look at translating this information, but I know Ida is already looking at um, talking to you all about that. Um, if in the meantime, while all these things are done, you definitely need to be making sure that the translator is clear on this, um, on this information. So, um, also if there is a child that is distressed, just like, um, just like in psychosocial support, we need to be reassuring them that what they're feeling is really normal given what's happened and, um, and, uh, um, and that we need to be giving them some type of information but we also need to be making sure they're adequately supported and there's a number of ways to do that. But when you go into an interview, I would be already thinking about that sort of stuff. You have some sort of idea of what you're going to hear. Um, I'd be making sure that you're not just going to leave a child on their own at the end of one of these interviews that there's already a, a person that they've picked that's going to be with them afterwards, even if it's a friend, um, a peer. But you definitely don't want to be leaving these kids on their own straight after these interviews, even if they do appear to be fine. We need to make sure we have some sort of safety plan. Does that make sense? So... We're coming to specific questioning now, and this is this is where we're very good. <laughs> we're very good at the specific questioning. Um, as I said, we would avoid it as much as possible. We certainly avoid it in the free narrative, and it would always come at the end of the interview. Um, and and this is just getting context around some of the memories. Um, 
things like where did you go next, who was there when you got there, what did it feel like, what was he wearing. Um, these these um, can be problematic, but but as long as you, you do it after you've exhausted the memory, um, they can be all right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would avoid asking kids what it felt like um, as much as possible because you just really want them to paint a picture. As soon as you go into the feeling component, um, it's, it's very risky and can be harmful if you're not trained to manage that. Yeah. So even though this is an important part of the interview process, um, we should keep it to a minimum. And it shouldn't be the main bulk of the interview. As I said, we should be going through an interview without really hearing our voice. Um, if, if we're unsure about things, you can ask the child to draw or to show you um, or to illustrate somehow what has gone on. But again, just like specific questioning, I would leave this to the end. I would leave this after free narrative, after you've really unpacked that memory in their brain and after you're really clear about the context that's surrounding it and you've got quite a bit of the information to get that. Um, and it would be the younger kids that would be doing that for sure, that have less ability to put language around a memory. Um, and we have to be very, very careful again around this and make sure that we do have some sort of referral pathway for these children. Um, and yeah, and the cultural context is really important and we need to be making sure that we understand that some of the questions and some of the responses may have different meanings in some cultures. Um, and that sometimes specific questioning a child can say yes regardless of if it's the correct answer or not because it's respectful to agree with the interviewer. So this is really important to know. The free narrative definitely overcomes some of that stuff as well um, because they're really just painting you a picture um, and that's how we remember things anyway. So specific cued recall questions, Greg hit me, when did Greg hit you? when I was in the park with everyone, who was at the park when Greg hit you, it really hurt when Greg hit me on the arm, where did Greg hit you on the arm? I mean, these are very simplistic um, stories comparatively to what you hear, but it's a good way of really illustrating how these questions can be put. Um, and then you can also just go back into free narrative. If, if you've done free narrative, you've gone into a specific question, you've got extra information, you could then go back into free narrative after some specific cued recall questions if you thought it was going to be useful. Specific yes or no, these are the ones that we're very good at. Can you tell me what you've come to talk to me about today? Yes. <coughs> Did Greg go to the park with you? Yes. Did it hurt when Greg hit you in the face? Yes. And sometimes they come across to the child also is a bit silly, like the last one, did, did it hurt when Greg hit you in the face? No, it didn't hurt. It could be an answer you'd get from an adolescent, for example. Whereas when you're using free narrative, they put the language around it. They let you know what's going on. This is really important to ensure reliable information. Minimising this confirmation bias. So minimising our bias within an interview context. So be flexible in the form of your questions, which is free narrative makes it flexible. Don't interrupt. Pursue all avenues. So don't ex just have your pre-existing ideas and go down that path. You may get more information and you actually may get more incidences. Let the child or young person do most of the talking. Establish a relationship in which the child or young person feels that they can correct you. So make sure that that child feels like they can say to you, actually, I think you're misunderstanding what I'm saying, particularly adolescents and those over 10. Um, but even between the ages of 5 and 10, they, they'll tell you whether you're on the right track or not when you're, um, when you're uh, repeating some of what they've said so that they can continue their free narrative. 
And then we've got closure. Is everything making sense so far? Great. So then we've got the closure component. This is really important no matter if you've had to finish an interview very early on in the piece and you haven't got all of the information you're expecting to get but the child is very emotional. It's, it's, it's almost putting you know a cap on the bottle. It's really critical to, to um, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's. Make sure everything is, is complete in the process. Um, it also puts the picture in a place where it needs to be for that child, so which is healthy in, a, in an environment where they're living in, in constant, profound stress and toxic stress. So explain what you will do. So explain what you'll do with the information and that also means explain what you will do as in the information that might mean that you might refer them to a certain service or give them some sort of response. Explain that to them um, and explain what you won't do. Explain what happens next. Yeah, if the child refuses to see, that's fine, but you can still give them the information. Um, yeah, you can still give them all that information. Exactly, don't give any expectations. Yeah, don't make any promises you can't keep. But it's really important to give them the information they need. Um, provide an opportunity for the child to ask any questions. Um, provide any necessary contact details. Don't make any promises. Don't raise their expectations. Don't thank the child for telling their story. This is very critical because um, in a situation where they are under um, profound stress, what this can actually do um, is, yes, exactly reward. It, 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 sounds, it sounds for us maybe it wouldn't be rewarding, but for them it may be the best reward they've ever had. Um, and it actually can um, encourage um, storytelling that is not reliable. Um, but in my experience, um, there are ways to thank the child with actually, without actually saying thank you um, uh, around talking about their story and, and, and this whole process of closure um, is a way to thank them without saying thank you. Yes, you can say thanks for, the, for taking the time, just not thanks for the story. But in my experience, because I'm an overthanker, I've had to remove thank you from the end of my closure. Um, and it hasn't really affected my closure with kids because when you're explaining what you'll do, what happens next, you're giving them information, you're getting, letting them ask questions, and you're finding out what they're doing next. So where are you going from here? Um, so this person's going to come and get you now. I'll wait for you with that. I'll wait for you here. Wait with you here until that person comes. For example, um, that that can quite often be enough. Um, and taking your time and not rushing it. Um, if the children ask for something, for example, to call his or her family or give them money, what should we do? That should have already been really clear at the start of the interview and you reiterate that. You have to be really clear with your boundaries on this. If, if you're meant to call his or her family, so maybe you've, uh, maybe you've taken them to another location to have the interview so that they feel safer when you're meant to call mum or dad to come and get them, that's different. The best thing to do is to um, refer them to services. I don't think it's your role to actually um, give clothing or any sort of money in this situation because it's actually rewarding them for giving information and then they'll give more and it doesn't necessarily mean that the information is reliable. It can encourage other families to do the same, to find you, to tell you a story so then they can get the same response. Exactly. 
it may set up an expectation with others. So it's just like the thank you. Um, it's best not to do it. Best practice would say no, don't do that. And to, to set that out from the start. Um, and you're going to get the most reliable information if you do that, but refer them to services. I mean, if they're, they're really struggling, then, then you guys need to have a list of services um, that might be available. Does that make sense? It's not easy when you've got these children in front of you in really, really difficult situations. I really understand that. But it takes bravery um, and courage from the interviewer just as it does from the child. And it's just, you just got to see that as not your role in this situation. It's someone else's role, but not yours. Does that make sense? So what I would really encourage you all to do is when I send you the Dropbox information and you have your um, assessment template, so I would really encourage you to practice this with colleagues um, and particularly colleagues that are meant to be doing this interviewing process with you um, and really uh, do it every single day as often as you can. Tell me everything. People will get sick of it but what it will mean is it will naturally come um, off your tongue. It will naturally flow. And surprisingly, you'll get a lot more information out of any children in your life until they work out what you're doing. Any comments or questions? Any comments or questions at the end? Okay. In the interaction, can we talk UNICEF works and activities which the child may know, for example, referring to the school bags provided with UNICEF? Shah, do you mean um Char, do you mean that that you would explain how UNICEF works? Is that what you mean? Because yeah, you could do that quite easily if they don't know who UNICEF is. Um, yes, I will be sharing it, um, but I'm going to show you the Dropbox so it's easier for you to download. Yes, absolutely, Shah, that's right. So they may not know about UNICEF, so depending on what's age appropriate, um, you, would, you would work it that way. So the younger kids, obviously, they would have seen and maybe they would have experience some of the services, the older kids may be more aware. So you use whatever age appropriate. And ask them what they know about UNICEF. So if they say they know what UNICEF is, then ask them, tell me everything about UNICEF. Start it from the start of the conversation. It's quite interesting what kids will say about what they think UNICEF is. And you can also even clarify the information if needed. Any other comments or questions before we sign off? As I say, my suggestion for you guys today would be to, to really practice this. So as soon as you get the assessment layout, um, in a face-to-face -face environment, we would spend half the day practicing this. So I would encourage you to practice this wherever you go. Any tip to measure the exaggeration in an interview? Well, I mean, I think free narrative prevents that because you may have some exaggeration in the first layer, but as they go to the second and third layer and as you come down with your signposts, um, the story is minimised and gets a lot more clearer what's actually going on. If you use specific questions, you'll get more exaggeration and more unreliability.
Anything further? Are you okay, Ida? This good for you? And I'm happy to do something following up from this in, in a few weeks' time. Maybe we can do something um, where I can check in with each of the groups and um, and uh, we can practice and I can make sure that you're all feeling good about this. But you have to practice the free narrative. It's really, really not um, a normal way of processing. Yeah, I think everyone has to practice this afternoon. I think they have to all practice. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate your time and I really hope you found this to be really useful. Um, this has been recorded, so um, I'll send you the recording after this. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah, I think it's great. I think yeah, I think we'll we'll have a follow up meeting um, webinar in a few weeks' time to see how you're all going with the practice. Great, thank you, Rizwan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.